Hey, comic book fans, welcome back to Comic Book Corner 2.0. And fans, you're with me, Mike Spider Slayer, getting ready to bring you Countdown, episode number 70. That's right, fans, this is the show where Mike Spider Slayer counts down the comics that he bought from the week, all the way from worst pick of the week, all the way to pick number one. And this week, fans, we have a total of 10 comics altogether, 9 physical copies, 1 digital copy, and a book that was left out because I still haven't read the first series. So let's mention that book that I have left out. Uh, last week, I forgot to get Robin Rises Omega. Uh, I still have to read it. And uh, with that being said, I still have to read Batman and Robin issue number one. And I bought that digitally because my comic book store was, was uh, out of it. So uh, what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to have Robin Omega part one and part two. I'm going to read them together and then I'm going to do an individual review for that to see where the story is at so far. So look forward to that. Uh, but with that being said, let's get started with this week's countdown. It's a very busy week with San Diego. Comic-Con uh, on my other channel, Comic Frontline, where we're gathering all kinds of news, so uh, I had to fit this in this week, and uh, sorry about the delay on it, but let's get started. We're going to start with number 10, and number 10 this week was, yes, I'm sorry, Batman fans, Batman Eternal issue number 16. Uh, yes, this issue had to do more with Batwing in here. It had to do more with the Spectre. It had to do even more with the Joker's daughter in here. And Pig was in this particular issue as well. Um, I just don't like, again, the supernatural aspect of what's going on in this story right now. Um, this story and the art with, with this particular subplot that's going on really doesn't interest me all that much. And I feel that as a reader, you really almost don't have to know what's going on in this part of the story. You understand the main plot with Commissioner Gordon and Jason Bard and, and the new commissioner and, uh, and things like that. Um, there wasn't anything here that really grasped me in this particular book. Uh, I was bored with it all the way through. Uh, I didn't really find its purpose here. And uh, yeah, there's just it's just for me I, it just it just loses my interest when I when I read this particular book. Uh, it, in fact, in my opinion, it bored me so much I felt that I, it almost got me to a point where it was like, God, I really want to drop this series. But then I look at the other issues, the main story part, you know. Uh, that has me interested. Like, I want to know about Stephanie Brown. I want to know what happens to Commissioner Gordon. Uh, but everything else that surrounds it, I almost don't really care. And uh, so after reading this particular issue, uh, you know, I gave this one a 2 out of 5. I just it didn't like it. I don't like the artwork in it either. So, uh, yeah, 2 out of 5 for me. All right, so moving forward, uh, we're going to go on to number 9. And number 9's comic this week was... The Flash, issue number 33. Uh, the Flash has, has been pretty good. Uh, I don't think it's been as good uh, since Vendetti has been on the series. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of, of, of Wally West in this particular series. How they make him like this hoodlum kid and he's got a, you know, he's this troubled kid and Barry's, or, and Barry's got to go after him. So uh, I'm not a huge fan of it. The art is good. Uh, but at times when you see these these one particular panels here, uh, it's just like the people look like they're giants and they have little heads. And that's not the first time it happens. It happens a couple of times in here. And I'm just like, well, what's going on with the artwork here? And Barry's still in this particular issue trying to solve this particular crime that the crime syndicate was, was involved in. And there was these weapons being uh, taken. And um, we get to find out that uh, we have future... Uh, Barry Allen and and uh, he um, he goes against the trickster and he's trying to make the tricksters change his ways because he was uh, committed this crime uh, which I thought was was pretty interesting in this book and then you have Barry kind of go against uh, this roided up freak where uh, in the issue you get to see his heart kind of give out on him um, so. Uh, by the time you get to the end of this book, you actually find out who has been involved with these crimes. 
so it was an interesting tale. I, you know, uh, not much major story where it has to do with with Iron and, and Patty and the whole situation um, with Wally West. Uh, there was hints in there, and there was little scenes, but nothing that drove that forward. Um, so, you know, I feel that The Flash has been okay, but it hasn't been as great as as the last creative team has, has been on there. So uh, I'm going to give this one the 3 out of 5. I thought it was average. All right, so... Next, we go on to number eight, and number eight, which is Deadpool versus X Force, uh, issue number two. Uh, this is a cool issue. Eh? I mean, you got to take this story for what it's worth. It's got X Force and it's got Deadpool, and it has these these two basically, um, you know, going against each other before they actually meet in uh, in New Mutants issue number ninety eight. Uh, the artwork is done very well in this particular series. I, I really love the way it's drawn. And uh, you get to see, you know, some of the members of X-Force and Cable uh, try to go against Deadpool. Uh, it's pretty much the same as the last um, issue. Uh, you get to have a history lesson in this book because of, of, you know, you get to learn about the, I guess, the rebels. And you get to learn about the Revolutionary War and how certain things mess up the time stream. And we can see there's always been the, there's already been these ripple effects that's happening because there's weapons that are being developed that shouldn't really have been developed yet. Um, I think the humor is 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 done well in this series as of so far. Um, it's not forced like I feel a lot of Deadpool issues are or series excuse me or series actually are. And uh, you know when you come to the end of this particular issue, uh, you find Cable and Deadpool. Uh, doing fisticuffs, and uh, Deadpool gets the the upper hand here. Uh, so yeah, I, I like the last page. I, I like the cliffhanger here, and it has me intrigued uh, for issue number three. And I like the little recap they give you at the end of the issue. And they tell you everything that's happened at the end of the issue, and then there's like a little uh, Q and A, which kind of adds to uh, the book, and it makes it it gives it its own identity in a way uh so after reading deadpool versus x-force issue number two i gave this one a three and a half out of five stars a good series up to this point all right so 10 9 what was that 10 9 8 we're going on to number seven number seven was batman uh zero year issue number uh 33 i i thought that this was a uh, a solid ending to, you know, a series that uh, for a lot of people either enjoyed it or got tired of it. And I got tired of it. I feel that overall as a series, um, I think a 12-issue year event uh, is just way too long. I think this story would have read better, a lot better, in a trade fashion. Uh, or a series that maybe would have come out twice a month. And I hate to say that because I hate books that come out twice a month and you get paid double the money for your title. But it just was dragged on too long. Um, I like the ending here uh, in this particular series, how Batman uh, goes against the Riddler and he does all these, all the Riddler, uh, all the riddles. And, uh, you know, and I love the artwork. Uh, as usual in this book, um, I like the ending on how what could have been Bruce's Wayne's future life. Uh, you get to see that in the issue, you know, of what I guess what Alfred was thinking. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and I thought it was, you know, I thought it was a good ending. Uh, but it wasn't an ending that I thought was like, wow, that was fantastic. I can't believe this was the best event ever. Um, it just, again, it was it was okay for me. I think this particular issue, I think, was solid. Wasn't, for me, the best issue that I read in Zero Year. I think it was a couple issues back. Um, but this was a fun issue, and I like the Riddler and the Batman interactions here. So after reading this one, I gave this a three and a half out of five stars and I can't wait for the next story arc for Batman so you can get his story moving forward all right so next on this week's list uh, that I liked was number six and number six was Savage Dragon issue number 196 um, in this issue we find and we find out that 
Malcolm Dragon is recovering from injuries that happened in the last issue. He grabbed this Red Rage robot, I think it was called, and it blew him up. And, uh, you know, Malcolm has this crazy healing factor. And uh, it's very hard for him to die. So he's healing. He's being held hostage by these weird people uh, that basically what has happened has made them all ugly because they've drank this water. And they want Malcolm to go after uh, these particular people uh, because they have this cure that changed them back. Well, Malcolm being held hostage, so he doesn't trust these people. And he wants to be released. He does whatever he can to get released but he's drinking the water and he didn't realize it until after the fact and again it's changed all these people making them ugly uh which is which is kind of funny uh we get to see on this issue maxine uh who's looking for uh malcolm dragon uh because she's worried about him she's his on and off again girlfriend boyfriend relationship couple uh, so she wants to go back to him. The book has great artwork. It, you know, for me, I like Eric Larson's artwork. Uh, I've said this many times. I'm a huge fan of his uh, artwork from his run on The Amazing Spider-Man in the 90s. I think he did a phenomenal job with it, and it carries over here. And I love Savage Dragon because uh, it really has original characters, original type of artwork, and, and that's what draws me to this series because it's so different. Um, so... Yeah, this was an interesting story. By the time you got to the end of it, uh, we get to see the water take its effects on Malcolm Dragon, and he changes into this. And you're just like, oh, my God, that's insane right there. He's like, ah, he's got all these fangs and stuff, so it's nuts. Uh, so what happens, I don't know, but uh, it's a fun read. I really enjoyed it. And uh, same thing, I give this one three and a half out of five stars. Not the best book, uh, but it wasn't. it was above average, and it, it's entertaining for me. All right, so going forward, we go on to uh, number five, I think. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. And our top five book of the week goes to Saga, issue number 21, or chapter number 21. Now, in the last issue here, we got to see um, this janitor guy destroy Prince Robot the Fourth's wife, okay, and take his baby. And uh, he's not even aware, Prince Robot IV is not even aware that he has his son yet. He's been out partying at this sextillion place uh, where it's like this this strip resort where you can get hooked up with all these crazy like aliens. Uh, but that's another story. Um, this book opens up with um, Alana here and she's on the set of her her acting gig that she has. And uh, it looks like she's going to have to do this sex scene. And uh, we get to see in this particular series, or in this chapter that's going on right now, uh, it looks like we get to see, I think, what might be the unraveling of Alana and Marco, which is the couple in this book. Um, you know, you start seeing her doing more drugs. She does drugs on the set to get her by through the sex scenes. And it's even mentioned here in the dialogue um, you know, where she says, well, this is like, you know, something that's told in these, uh, cautionary tales at school, which was pretty funny. And then you see Marco, uh, who is the husband, uh, who's spending lots of time with this, this female here who actually has a, uh, you know, a child as well. And you notice in this book, you know, she puts his hand on his leg and things like that. So, and uh, Marco's not used to having his wife around. She's been busy working a lot. And, um, yeah, so you feel that, you know, there could be this love affair for Marco. And for Alana, there could be this drug addiction. And the other part of the story, you have the janitor here that was, <laughs> that was took the baby uh, from the princess. And uh, we get to see that he's killing all the soldiers, hijacked the ship. And, uh, yeah, so there's some crazy stuff going on in this issue. Uh, again, uh, Saga is not for the young. Uh, this book always has some kind of sexual stuff going on in the inside. Uh, but the dialogue is well done here because the story is told uh, by the baby, which is Hazel, I guess, as she's grown up. Uh, by the time you get to the end of this issue, you find out that Prince Robot IV uh, finds out he has a baby. And we find out that 
um, his prince, his princess was killed and the information was late given to him. So he's kind of pissed off about that. Uh, so yeah, Saga is a really good book. I really enjoy each and every issue. I like the family aspect of this book. Uh, I like, I like how, you know, they all interact with each other. And if this family, you know, goes south, it's going to be interested if they mend their ways. And that's even if the book goes in that direction. But by reading it, I feel that, again, the family is going to come apart. So after reading this book, I gave it a four out of five. I really enjoyed it. And that was number five. All right, so next on this week's list was Red Lanterns, issue number 33. Um, you know, I'm a huge Green Lantern fan, but I'm just not enjoying the Green Lantern books these days. And I have to take the next best thing, and that is reading the Red Lanterns. And guess who's in this book? John Stewart. John Stewart makes his appearance in Red Lanterns. Um, actually, working with Guy here, and Guy's trying to, you know, I guess John and Guy are talking with either each other, trying to mend ways, trying to get Guy to come back, and, and Guy doesn't want to. Um, but he's asking, you know, he's telling his story about what's happened to uh, the Red Lanterns, how uh, Trosses has come back, how he's poisoned the lake, and, uh, you know, he has to somehow get revenge on him. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, in this book, though, what was really sad to see uh, was Skalix and Zox, and this is Zox, and this is Skalix, and uh, Skalix has been kind of the guy who's been on the fence uh, about should I stay with Guy Gardner or should I go back to Atrocitus, um, you know, because Atrocitus is back, and in this issue, you actually read and you get to see what happens and the decision that's being made uh, by Skalix if he does go back to um atrocitous or not also you get to see the struggles with blees uh in this issue too uh blees and rancor because rancor is back to a mindless red lantern and they don't have a red lake to make him pure again to have his thoughts back so they're trying to solve the issues with that um as the issue continues uh you get to see atrocitous, atrocitous and you get to see his new red lanterns that are among him now as well um, I think Red Lanterns is a really good lantern book, and Guy Gardner fits this series. Uh, and each and every issue, I find myself intrigued and wanting to read more about the story on what's going to happen with Atrocitus and Guy Gardner. Is Guy Gardner eventually going to become a Green Lantern again? He might, but right now I think he fits the Red Lantern series, and he has actually made Red Lantern series a top lantern book and one of my favorite books to read each and every month so after reading this book i'm going to give this one a four yeah i think a four out of five i think this one was really good so yeah all right so we're going to move on to number three and number three this week and it kind of actually surprised me and i forgot to pick it up at the comic book store i don't know what was what i was thinking uh but it was New 52's Future End, issue number 12. Uh, yeah, this being in the top three, it really, um, it really, it shocked me to death. Um, I thought this issue was uh, phenomenal, um, you know, when it came to the ending. I think maybe parts of it were a little bit slow, um, but for the most part, I thought that this was a, a really solid book. Uh, the book is not loading on the nook at, at the moment, uh, so I can't really show you the pictures. But we learn in this particular issue um, that the Joker is still alive in the future. I think it was like 35 years from now. And we also learn that Bruce Wayne is alive as well. And to see those characters... Um, so far in the future was awesome. Now we saw Bruce Wayne alive and you thought he was dead after that first issue, but now he's alive and it was great to see Joker as an old man. I think that was pretty neat too. Um, and it was great to see a glimpse into the future again from this series where you haven't seen that since the very beginning, since issue number one. 
Uh, you get to see all of the other little bits and pieces and random stories like you usually do, usually do in, in Futures End, New 52. Uh, but the ending of this, these last few pages really made the issue for me. And it, it leaves hope for Futures End. And uh, so after reading that one, I gave this one a four out of five as well. So what made number two this week? Uh, number two was Superman issue number 33. That's right. Um, really enjoyed this series. It could have made number one if it wasn't for the artwork. I'm just not a huge fan of Ramita Jr.'s artwork in here. I think at times it's okay, but there's just other times where I'm just like, God, I can't stand looking at his artwork. Um, you know, right here where you see Ulysses, he's just some weird block looking guy in a way and he's just got this square head and I'm just not a huge fan of it I'm not a huge fan of of Clark the way he's drawn in this particular issue um, you know but artwork aside the story that Jeff Johns is telling in this book I, I think is is really solid um, it's great to see you know the Daily Planet like back um, and you see a lot of it too and you see Perry White trying to get all his staff members to get the next big story, the next best Superman story. And you hear him yelling, and it's just like you, you, you like you feel the character in the book. And that's what I really liked about this. It's just like, yeah, he's, he's like Perry White. He's in there, you know. He threatens Jimmy Olsen in here. He's like, what are you doing, just standing around? And he's like, tell you, get a, get a clear picture of of this Superman. And it's just funny because throughout the issue, Jimmy's trying to get a clear picture. Of of the of Ulysses and it's like this little kid get, <laughs> he gets in this way he blocks him and he sits there and goes hey you just ruined my shot so Jimmy like can't get a, a clear shot in in the in the book which I thought it was funny and Clark sits down and, and talks with uh, Ulysses and he tells him that he wears an identity to you know to blend in with the crowd uh, which I thought was really nice and then uh, Ulysses looks at you know family pictures here and uh he wants to blend in the crowd and he wants to be part of of, of what earth has to offer and i thought it was a, a really cool story but then what happens is ulysses uh gets attacked in the issue and he's getting shot at and uh yeah there's some crazy stuff going on in this particular book and at the end of the issue um you get to see uh ulysses uh, meet up with his parents and I think that was a really nice story uh, because at the end of the first issue you get to see what his parents did with them he sent them uh, away because the, the whole place was was blowing up so uh, really really great issue I really enjoy the story here uh, again was what makes this not push it to number one was because there was a better issue that may not necessarily be better but it had me much more intrigued and uh and so the number one book for this week was uh original sins tie-in to amazing spider-man issue number four um i thought this book was m maybe not the best written book and it had me with a lot more questions than answers and wanting to read more but i thought that the story here was I gotta give Dan Slott credit for trying to create this original story uh, and introducing a new character into Spider's Spider-Man's universe. You know, I mean, this is a first full appearance. Uh, if you go into today's modern comics, you know, back then, you know, first full appearance could could mean big bucks, but comics these days they're not worth anything. Uh, but in this particular issue, uh, we get to see Peter doing his normal work. You know, trying to come up with this electro net. Uh, to stop Electro, uh, and then there's danger that happens, and you get to see the whole original Sin tie-in and what his experience was, and I like how that happened in this issue. You get to see him get involved with the battle, and you get to relive uh, how Orb, um, you know, revealed the Watcher's eye and his experience on everything that he's seen, and then how he, again, reveals how the eye is like a bomb, and then it's going to blow. Uh, I really like that, and then you get to see everything that happens in uh, in Peter's uh, in Peter's original sin experience, and he realizes that there's somebody else. 
so he goes and he goes to this this secret lair uh, of where Silk is being captive. And uh, you know, after a couple messages here, we we've 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 seen Silk with the hair over her face the whole time. It's kept her identity revealed the whole time. So it's been lots of mystery, lots of build up. And, and, and this is what you get. You get here, right here. And she comes out at Spider-Man and she's like, you released me and he, Merlin's going to come. And it's kind of like, okay, how does Merlin know that you're going to be released? And I didn't know that Merlin was dead or where he was being kept. I just don't remember that story and what happened. So I felt myself a little bit like, okay. And if you pay attention to this is, is that he's, you know, he's smelling and he's sniffing and he's like the spider bride. Uh, he's, he's like this, yeah, he goes to spider bride and he's like the great hunt begins. So I guess this means now spider verse is upon us. And what the issue does really nice job with is, is the artwork. I like the artwork, uh, that's provided here, uh, for, for the readers. Uh, I think that Herberto Ramos does a nice job with the series and, and I like how the powers match up against each other. Spider-Man does a great job of describing what powers she does have, what he's better at, what she's better at, and uh, and I, I think they did a fun job with that. And you get to see that the webs come out of her um, out of her fingertips, whereas Spider-Man's, you know, actually it's a man-made contraption. So her spider power is a little bit more evolved, I think. And uh, you know, she's being captive in this this layer for all this time. Uh, you know, since she discovered she had these powers, or like parents put her there. And so now you get to see Silk, which her name is, and her real name is Cindy Moon. Uh, you get to see her put on a, a self-made spider outfit, which I, I'm not a huge fan of. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that. Uh, I think she will get her own outfit in time because if you saw the San Diego Comic-Con news, uh, Silk will be teaming up with Jessica Drew. Jessica Drew's getting her own series, and it looks like Silk has her own spider costume, not just a webbing. So I wasn't a huge fan of this. And then what happens is in this issue is that I'm also not a huge fan of, like, Silk being so, like, bipolar. She's like, Moreland's released. And then she's like, oh, he's dead? Oh, you mean Skippy? You know, she's all happy. And then she's like, what? He could come back. And then she, like, slaps Peter. And then the next thing you see is uh, crazy facial expressions. And then the next thing you see at the end of this issue is as they're, like, fighting each other. You know, I'm like, they're both spider people. Why are they fighting each other? It's all of a sudden they have this this attraction towards each other and they start uh making out against the building here and i'm just like dude what is going on and i, I totally was not expecting that and that's what made me like holy cow like what, what's happening and i feel that it could be their powers that are drawing them attracting to each other and Roland mentioned this thing about spider bride so i'm not sure where that's coming from um but I like the issue. I thought the issue was was really good. I like the introduction to the character. It, I just have so many questions. Like, what's going to happen with Silk? Um, how are them hooking up with each other? Um, I could have done without that part. Maybe build up the character a little bit more. And then have this attraction. Uh, and then kiss and be like, oh my god, what's happening? But I don't know. Dan Slott has something planned here. How this leads to Spider-Verse, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but I thought it was a great read. It has me definitely intrigued. Uh, that's why I got the number one pick for me. Not maybe necessarily the best written book. Um, and maybe not the best book I've ever read this week. So after reading it, I gave it a four and a half out of five stars. Because it definitely wasn't perfect. Um, and uh, yeah, so... That got my number one pick. <laughs> so there you have it, guys. There is the countdown for this week. Uh, here's my new shirt also. And uh, you tell me what your favorite comic book of the week was, what your worst comic book be comic book was of the week. And as always, guys, thank you for watching Comic Book Corner 2.0. And I'll see you guys on the next comic book review. Thanks for watching, guys. See you soon. Bye.